Hey everyone, happy Halloween! It's a good thing that we record all our shows because if you're out trick-or-treating, you'll be able to see our fantastic show tonight. And everyone here at Nissan Communications Networks just wants everyone to know that has been affected by Hurricane Sandy. We are thinking of you all and you're in our thoughts and prayers and we hope that you continue to be safe and um, we'll all get through it together. So what's a rational psychic? And why does our guest say that whatever is going on inside is causing a paranormal response? So is that really a ghost you're seeing or not? Those questions and more are going to be answered tonight. Okay, in tonight's Get Off the Couch segment... Got our new sound effect there. Did someone annoy you this week? I know one of my dearest friends annoyed me this morning, and I'm really, really angry. But in situations like that, I always ask myself, what is it about me? Because something inside of me triggered that to be so angry, and the person who annoyed me is just a reflection of that. So if something really, really gets your goat, I'm going to encourage you to use that for further self-exploration and see if there's something you can find out about yourself to help Shift that, change that, and get going again. Okay, we're going to tell you about tonight's guest. Jack Rourke is the author of The Rational Psychic, A Skeptic's Guide to Extraordinary Perception. Jack is a recognized paranormal expert and commentator who has appeared internationally on Showtime, the BBC, the History Channel, and the Travel Channel. Dubbed world-renowned by website Pop Eater for his psychic work on criminal and missing persons cases, Jack was the go-to guy for CNN when they needed a spiritual perspective on the passing of Michael Jackson. He was also featured as a real-life Patrick Jane, the lead character in the hit TV series The Mentalist. Jack has also consulted on such feature films as The Haunting in Connecticut, Push, and Friday the 13th. His radio appearances include, but are not limited to, Coast to Coast with George Norrie, CBS's Overnight America with John Grayson, Manukau Morning Radio Network, and countless other regional and internet-based radio programs around the world, such as Clear Channel Speaking of Strange with Joshua Warren, BIM Radio, the Paranormal Portal Radio Network, Aussie Chat, and the BBC, RTE, AOL, and MS Radio Networks. And we're going to go ahead and call Jack now. He's on. Well, yes. Hello. Hey, Jack. Good evening. How are you? Hi. Good evening. I was just—I wasn't expecting you on this phone. I, uh, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> sorry, I know Jack's from LA, and we were stuck in traffic. And do you want yeah, us to? Was, are you was, back home? Do you want us to call your other number? I. Yeah, if, if that works better for you, or we can we can just go. Yep, the other number's a landline. We'll go ahead and call that right back. And so everyone, while we're calling Jack back, we're excited to have you here tonight. And what was your favorite Halloween costume? For me, I was Static Kling one year, although I have to say my brother did the best Halloween costume possible. He lit, was in college in Tennessee at the time, but traveled to Ohio and was a gerbil and actually built a moving cage that worked and... Word got back to my mother in West Virginia about his costume, so he did a pretty good job. And again, I'm just very grateful that we are recording tonight, so if you're out trick-or-treating, you will be able to hear our interview. Uh, I think it's a really important subject. All right, Jack, we've got you on. All right, I'm here. Excellent. So let's talk about your book. Although you're a psychic, you are also yes. ex- you call yourself a skeptic, so explain that. Well, it's it's really very simple. What's important for people to understand about the rational psychic, a skeptic's guide to extraordinary perception, is this. A rational psychic, I'm not necessarily referring to me. Anyone can be a rational psychic. Rational is someone grounded in facts who works with integrity and has a desire to serve others selflessly with love. And so that's where I came up with the term the rational psychic. A skeptic is really is, is even probably more important to understand because I think folks are used to seeing cynics portrayed as skeptics in the media. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a cynic is someone who, you know, wouldn't believe in a psychic if he or she sat down in front of them and told them a million things they couldn't possibly know or predicted something or 
viewed something remotely, they'd say impossible. They'd come up with any number of excuses why it wasn't real. Or if a UFO landed on their house <laughs> and they had 100 witnesses, they'd say, nope, nope, I didn't see it. You know, but that's not what a skeptic is. A skeptic is someone who has an open mind, who honestly investigates or goes on into an inquiry into that which is assumed to be true. So a skeptic's guide to extraordinary perception is just that. It's an open-minded guidebook that really answers some of the most essential questions about perception. Some of them are extraordinary in that they seem fantastic or supernatural or they're completely out of the ordinary. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have genuine extrasensory perception. So this is a really, really important book for people, especially if you're interested or are a practicing psychic, because what this book does is it shows you from the inside out on experiential level how to discern the psychic signal from the extraordinary noises created by the brain, by emotions, and by environmental influences. Well, Jack, I wanted to ask you, I thought the book was great. It was very interesting when I was reading it. I belong to a spiritual group on Facebook, and someone was posting about all these experiences they were having, and I thought, ah, oh, I said, go to this man's site, get the book when it comes out, and it'll explain everything. But one thing I found fascinating, because I consider myself a skeptic, most definitely. I believe in a lot of things and have an open mind, but I always question it. But I don't know a lot about paranormal things, but I found this fascinating with your book. You said it's easier to think of paranormal and psychic phenomenon as things that happen to you rather than things that occur in conjunction with you or that actually um, emanate from your heart. So can you explain that? Yeah, they emanate from you, yes. Well, this is, this is one of the, the things that we have, to, we have to address again and again and again, is that, you know, when we define something paranormally uh, or explain something paranormally, we're not saying that something doesn't exist. We're not saying that something didn't occur. Uh, any paranormal experience is absolutely real on an emotional level. It is experientially real. Paranormal events uh, create measurable uh, changes in the brain and in our body and in our experience. So the experience is real. What the, what the rational psychic does is talks about the perception. Remember, we're talking about the extraordinary guide to perception or the guide to extraordinary perception. So what we're, what we're wanting to understand is why we perceive certain things. So there's a, there's a difference between defining how, defining or, or explaining how we perceive something versus explaining the nature of what that which is perceived is. Um, and so this is a really, really important uh, point to, to drive home because, you know, with, when dealing with people who believe they're having psychic encounters or, or perceiving psychic information, you know, oftentimes what we find is that we, that we use belief systems to explain what it is that we are perceiving. And I'll give you an example. Uh, for instance, you walk into a home or something, and maybe you, you feel a bad feeling. Um, you, you have a sense of being watched. You feel something makes you uncomfortable. So because there's a negative reaction, you know, people will say, oh, this place is haunted, or there's, you know, this place, or there's a demon, or there's, there's this ill thing or that ill, ill thing. And what we need to do is understand is that, you know, psychic information is those things that can be objectively verified. In the book, I split perception into two things, paranormal perception and psychic perception. And psychic perception, like I said, is the perception of information in a means that's other than the five, through other than the five physical senses. And it's important that those things be objectively verified because that's how you condition yourself to receive honest and authentic extrasensory information. If you just go by your feelings, as it were, I walk into this house, 
and I feel like I'm being watched. I feel creepy. I, I have this sense of something foreboding. Oh, that means ghost. Oh, that means this. Those things can't be objectively verified by and large. So what we're doing is we're sort of we get involved in a self-serving loop of logic where I'm having these sensations, I'm experiencing these feelings, therefore my belief system tells me this means this, it means ghost, or it means that. And then because my experiences are real, and I believe this is what's causing it, I must be psychic to experience that, therefore I am psychic. And you get caught in this self-deluding loop of logic. Um, and when you're tr with my students and when you're training psychic, there's two really, really important things that we need to accomplish. One is is helping people understand how to recognize extrasensory information. And the second thing is then applying positive reinforcement for the recognition of objectively verifiable information. And so when you don't require that your information be objectively verifiable, you are, you're, you're, really, you're limiting your own capacity and you're cheating yourself out of really achieving some phenomenal success. So this is, this is an essential thing um, when looking to understand um, extraordinary perceptions. And it's also important, especially for when you're looking to train or take your ability up a notch, is not to get caught into in belief systems. Do you believe there is a difference between being psychic and intuitive? Hmm. Well, that's, a, that's another really great question. And uh, I'm going to say, say this. Intuition or being intuitive is, is commonly um, used, uh, it's commonly understood to be synonymous with being psychic. Now, you know, intuition just simply means direct knowing or having direct knowledge of. So, you know, to, you know psychic perception or being psychic is, in essence, a direct knowing, okay? But the, their distinction is here. When you really put things in context of what it really means to be psychic. Intuition and psychic perception are two very different things, and it's important to draw the line here because by understanding this, you're going to make yourself a much better psychic and potentially even make yourself uh, a more balanced and, uh, and sensible human being. And I'm going to explain it this way. Um, Julie, you and I are talking, right? And let's say that you come to me as a friend and you say, hey, Jack, I'm, I'm having this issue. Um, what do you think about that? And I start saying, well, Julie, you know what? You need to do this, and, and then you should do that. And you know what? You really should tell that so-and-so to, to just do this, <laughs> you know. And you're like, no, 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 you, know, you, don't, you don't understand. This is what I'm going through. And I say, yeah, I get it, but you do this and you do that. Now, what's happening is I'm using my intuition to offer you advice as a friend but what the experience for you is is Jack you're not listening to me this isn't what I need and and here in where here is the problem intuition is a personal guidance system intuition is the expression of all of our past experiences that speak to us via our feelings now what is right for me may not be right for Julie. And so if I try to impose my personal guidance system onto you, I'm not being a good friend. And once more, that's not psychic. Okay? Psychic perception is, is receiving or perceiving impersonal information on behalf of your client or in service to a law enforcement professional or a business or something like this. If I'm sitting with one of my law enforcement clients and I start, you know, giving them this obtuse information about, you know, um, anything that's, you know, kind of personally relevant to me, it's, just, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. They need objectively verifiable information about, you know, another source or, or some other, um, you know, a suspect or something like that, that that can be gleaned to the five physical senses. So intuition, personal guidance, psychic perception, impersonal. So there's very, it's very important to, to distinguish between the two if we're really going to understand the nature of authentic psychic perception. 
That's an excellent definition, and I've never heard it quite said like that. But let me give you an example. I consider myself definitely intuitive, would never call myself psychic. But I had something, this has only happened to me once. And I was in my bedroom, and I felt the presence of someone I knew who it was. Now, it was, at the time, my boyfriend's mother who had passed when he was a child. So I'd never met her, Mm -hmm. but I knew it was her. And I was like, okay. And I said, well, you know, hey, it's all good have a message or something I can pass along in the morning. I'm all open to that. And now it just happens that two or three days later, I was Skyping with a potential guest. And so his mother came through and I was like, look, I'm happy to pass it along. I know I'm your best bet. But so what would you say that was about? Because one of the things that I found fascinating in your book is you talked about how with some psychic phenomenon that's related to unresolved issues. So I'd love your thoughts on that. Okay, I want to make sure that I'm understanding what your question is. You're, okay. you're, you're talking about your experiences with perceiving mediumistic type information and wondering how that relates to an unresolved emotional issue? Well, if that's the case or how you would consider that, because, again, I'm not a medium. I wouldn't consider mm-hmm. myself that. Stuff like that rarely happens, but Mm -hmm. I guess when you're looking in the context of being psychic or being intuitive, and I'm guessing there are probably a lot of people out there that have had similar situations that would consider themselves to be intuitive, but not Mm -hmm. necessarily psychic, but would wonder, well, hey, kind of when that stuff happens. Does that make sense? Uh, I think we'll feel our way through it, but what what I'm getting from you, what I'm hearing you say, is you're needing to understand the role that emotion or someone's personal stuff may influence perception. Yes. Um, And so regardless of, you know, your psychic encounter, whether or not it was legit or or how to explain that, that's really, that's really unrelated. Um, And and I'm going to, I'm going to explain it to you this way and to your listeners this way. What's essential to understand is when you begin psychic exploration, when you begin psychic development, the way through which, you experience and interpret phenomena is through your mind, primarily, first and foremost. Okay, so when you engage in psychic development, it is a slow, methodical process that conditions the individual to disassociate from their five physical senses. All that really means is you're withdrawing your awareness from these signals that flow through your ears and through your eyes and, you know, all these other sensory stimulus. You're pulling away from that and learning to become comfortable with the void within your mind, okay? So what happens is as you disconnect from that inflow of information, that inflow of information is what actually essentially suppresses what's already within you deep within your subconscious think of it think of it as as if your bathtub had an up pressure of water that could flood back up into the bathtub and it would be you know it would be dirty because the pipes etc cetera, etc cetera. but so long as you keep your your tap running the, the pressure of that water running down into the pipe keeps all that dirty water um, down there it keeps it flushing through Okay, so that's that, that down, that clean water that, that flushes downward, that's all your sensory input. So when you turn that off, when you disassociate from your sensory input and you turn that off, what happens is everything that's in those pipes underneath the tub can now tickle up to the surface. And it's the same way with our minds. When you disconnect from the sensory input, what's stored in the subconscious begins to dance in front of your awareness. Now what happens is sometimes, most often, actually not sometimes, most often, what's stored outside of your conscious awareness is our our feeling-based impressions, uh, unresolved emotions, things that traumas that happened to you when you were younger, uh, even things that occurred that you witnessed or experienced before you had the language to interpret or understand what exactly these things are. Now, Ed, in an earlier rendition of the book, I got into this much more deep, deeply. Uh, but I, what I want to say is that even 
in, in infancy, though and we're going this far back, before your eyes are fully developed and your brains are developed enough so that we can actually interpret the signals that pass into our eyes, we are, our consciousness is already storing information. Now imagine what it's like as an infant. If you, there's no way most of us, I'm sure almost no one can remember this, but imagine what it would be like as an, as an infant and you're absolutely helpless. You can't defend yourself. You're reliant completely on these people that you can't even make out what their faces are, but you know they smell good and they're warm and energetically that we feel bound to them and they take care of us. Let's imagine that a dog comes up and sniffs, sniffs our face or something else that comes close to us that we don't understand or there's a loud noise. We don't have the ability to, to interpret and explain these signals that are coming, coming into our awareness and they, they leave little tiny imprints of, of inexplicable, inexplainable things. And so as you, as an adult, as you begin to develop psychically and you begin experimenting with, your, with accessing your subconscious, all of these types of things begin to reenter conscious awareness. And what happens is, is that when you don't require your psychic information to be objectively verifiable, you use these haunted impressions to, to experience what you believe is psychic. You, people tend to say, oh, this is when I have this, I have this bad sensation or I have this, and they run to their belief systems to, to explain what it is they're they're experiencing and what happens is when they do that and they slip into that self-deluding cycle of self-affirmation their development stalls because what happens is this is the spiritual aspects of being a psychic is when you go within you must address resolve heal and process the wounds within you because only when you go deeply deep, deep, deep within your own humanity, owning who and what you are and resolving and processing these issues, can you ever really experience the fullness of your own divinity or the true expression of what it, of that, that divine spark that is within you, deep within you. And similarly, when you go within and you do this work, you must do this work, I should say. That's the only time you can get through those shadows and catch a glimpse of what it's really like to work from an authentic, pure place. Uh, it's, it's, it's essential. It's absolutely essential that once we get to process our own emotions, our own wounds, our own issues, before we can step out there, and really begin to, to objectively perceive information in a really clean, clear, holistic way. Well, I want to remind everyone that's listening, if you have a question for Jack, feel free to write it on chat and I will ask it, or you can call in at 919-518-9773 or Skype in at Computers 2K Voice. Jack, what would you recommend to people? I believe that psychics, what I, would, I prefer the term intuitive counselors, can be really valuable. I've also seen them be very destructive. When I lived in Los Angeles, I took my mom to get a reading, and the psychic told her she was going to die. So mm -hmm. it took a long time to, you know, she was pretty upset in the moment, and probably a year for her to, to get over that. Now, I obviously, they were trying to say transforming her life, but I think if people aren't grounded or very desperate, that a lot of times they fall prey to people. So what, if so, if their intuition's not there, what would you say to them to look for um, a reliable and honest psychic? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was, um, I was reading for a client. I think she was in Arkansas or someplace. And, uh, you know, we had, we had done some really good work together. And at the end of it, you know, her final question was, you know, she feels like she's cursed. And I said, well, I don't understand. Why would you feel that way? And she said, well, I went to this psychic once, 
and she told me that I had this, that, and the other bad thing going on inside of me. She goes, I paid her $500 for these crystals, and I was supposed to do these rituals with these crystals, and then I was supposed to be free of this issue. And, of course, you know, this comes on the heels of over an hour of, of some very distinct information that was right on the money with her and I said look I said let me ask you something I said you can hear that I'm getting angry and she said yes and I said I'm not angry at you I said I'm angry that people do this I said did this woman did she tell you x y and z and she anything and she said no I said did she do anything close to what I just did with you and she said no I said then she's a fraud and I and she said what do you mean I said she Put, she put fear inside of you and then asked you to pay her to take it out. And I, she said, well, so you mean because I never completed the, the, the crystal rituals that, that she, she said, I think I looked online and, and some people were commenting that she's more of a witch than a psychic, you know, and it just opened up a whole other conversation. You know, here's the thing about psychic ethics. We have a tremendous responsibility, and unless you're willing to accept that responsibility, you shouldn't be doing this work. If you have an inability to deal with truth, you shouldn't be doing this work. If you have an inability to provide objectively verifiable information, you shouldn't be doing this work, full stop. There's, there's, there's no getting around it, you know, because people – now, a lot of critics – Say that people that, that deal with psychics, you know, they're, they're fragile, vulnerable people. But I'm here to tell you that's not true. You know, my, my clients include MDs, PhDs, attorneys, um, you know, people who fly drones for the U.S. government. I have some, you know, th- these are serious people with, they're, and they're seriously educated. We all suffer, we all have problems. You know, we all, no matter where, so what, what, where, where you come from or what you do for a living or what your education is, we're all human beings first. And being a psychic is, is just having the ability to be fully human with your client and to allow that humanity to touch and heal lives. If, if you get involved in any of this kind of doomsaying and, and magic nonsense, you're not for real walk away you know that's what you stay away from i don't know if i answered your question but this topic is very uh, is upset to me (laughs) i I, know i can tell that and i appreciate it and you know one thing that i've done um people have asked to be on the show and i've said no i trust my intuition on that and i've set the intention that i'll have only people with integrity on the show and so I, i just after my mom's experience and other experiences that i've seen i just feel it's really important uh, you know, to help people with that. We've got several questions for you on chat here, um, Jack. Okay. David wants to know, what do you do to earn a living? Well, I do psychic readings, and I authored a book. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought, but I always like to ask the viewers questions. Now, I'm yeah. um, Wicked Willie would like a reading on the air, but I, we're here to discuss your book, so unless you, you know, feel very strongly against that, Jack... Um, I think we'll just get to other questions, but it's your call. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, it, had I not just been late for our late for our uh, our interview, I may have taken take, taken the opportunity to to offer a reading, but I'm I'm not in the headspace right now to do that. Okay, baby JJ wants to know: Did you go to school to learn to be psychic? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. Well, you know there are there are places out there that do. Um, that do uh, offer schooling and, and teaching uh, to psychics. Um, there is actually there's small institutes around the United States. There's you know there's a college, uh, Arthur Finley College in England. I actually did not go to school. I I tell a funny story about a a little psychic school that I visited uh, early on in my career. Um, and I thought that it would be interesting, maybe I should take some classes. And so they offered a, a psychic fair where you could go in and their students would read for you. 
And, you know, I'd already been doing this on my own for a couple of years, and I thought, you know, I had a good idea, you know, at least what I was looking for, but if there was a school, I would certainly be interested in, in, in looking into it, you know. And so what I did is I went down there, and as I was sitting there getting a reading by one of their students, I, you know, I heard uh, someone belch really loud. <laughs> Okay, that was rude. You know, I just shook it off. And then, you know, a couple of these guys talking about talking to me about past lives and this and that. So I was already starting to get turned off. You know, I'm at the time, I, I mean, I'm in, in good shape, but at the time I had a very athletic physique. I had a sleeveless shirt on. So, you know, he was started talking to me about I was a Roman gladiator and a past life and a warrior and all this. And I'm thinking, okay, here we go, you know. He's just looking at me, and he's making these, these these assessments and talking about things that can't be proven or disproven, you know. And so I heard someone else belch, and then someone else belch, and then someone else, like, passed wind. And I'm like, what, what is going on? And so I got up, and I, and I just finished this reading, and I, a little mini reading, and I'm walking around the room, and I noticed again and again and again, like, it was it was the readers, it was the students at this place that were doing this stuff, and I come to find out that part of the curriculum that they were teaching these these young uh, psychic students was to relieve tension in their body to belch oh. or fart. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is this place is not for me, and I left. So my point of telling the story is this: is that there are schools out there, there are people who claim to train psychics. But you have to use your your good judgment. You have to you have to really evaluate. You know, use your intuition. You know, um, personally, no, I didn't. I didn't attend a school. Um, this is this is something that has been a lifelong um, ability of mine. And what I did was I worked to to find a rational, real-world explanation for how this works and why it works. And I really, um, I talk about early in the book, I talk about how I got interested in this and why. Hey, Jack, and, we've got a caller for you, actually, a live caller, if we can just break in for a second. Okay. Hi, who's here? Hello, hey, you're on the air. Sorry. I'm sorry, Jack. Didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. We no, had someone no, call, okay. though. No, I, was, I was just going to say that what got me interested in this work is when I was a teenager, I had a twin sister who died. Mm -hmm. And I talk about this in the book because I think it's really important for people to understand that from where I'm coming from is that I'm, I'm not unlike, you know, many people who are interested in this work. And when she died, uh, a being appeared to me. I was actually in what would be sort of like a trance state and lifted me from my body and he said don't be afraid and I and I thought well that's weird and he said your sister's dead and he said look and I'm, I'm you know kind of really condensing this story but I looked to my uh, my awareness I moved my awareness to my right and I saw my sister standing there outside of her body and my sister was in a wheelchair her entire life, and she never walked. And I saw her bright and healthy and standing upright uh, and beaming, full of joy and just, and, and just a lit from within. And so she was liberated from all the suffering that she endured her entire life. And it was a short time after that, after I'd come out of that state, that I was, I was told she had, in fact, passed. Um, and so that was the first time that I ever can really say that I received information in a way other than my five physical senses that can be objectively verified. Now, and from that, go ahead. Well, I'd say, does that, the daydreamer asked, what was your earliest psychic experience? Would you say that was it? That, I mean, I had other experiences when I was, when I was a small boy, but uh, I point to this because it was so dramatic and so profound that it forever changed how I look at life and death and what I, what I know to be true. You know, I base, you know, had I not spent the last, you know, 15 to 20 years doing readings, I would still 
point to that and say, how the heck did that happen? Why, would, why did I see this? Why was I able to not only just, this is, was a, it was a visceral experience, a visceral and visual and audio experience of something absolutely phenomenal. How did this occur? You know, mm-hmm. and so when I when I moved on, and I didn't believe in psychics. I was only I was into my twenties before I be, before I started to even consider the idea that these that psychics are even real. So uh, I don't want to give anyone the impression that I had this experience and that boom, I can, I was psychic and I started doing readings. You know, that's not true. Um, and it was it was it was dramatic. It was dramatic, and but what I knew was, sometime in my 20s, I was going through some challenging times. As as this perceptual ability was 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 really 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 nagging, and I it, I came to realize it was actually causing problems uh, in in my life. Like for instance, you know, Julie, you and I are at a party, and you're with your partner, and I'm with mine. And let's say you had a let's say you had a fight with your partner before you left the house. You said, you know what? Let's go to the party. We'll put a brave face on. We'll deal with this later. And then at the party, you meet me and my partner, and we're talking, and everyone's enjoying themselves. And then I say to you, hey, well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about insert your private conversation with your partner, um, but, you know, this is how we deal with that. We, have, we go through the same thing. And then your partner looks at you and, say, and says, how dare you share this mm-hmm. with a perfect stranger and mm-hmm. walks off? You know, I would get information about people in such a literal way that I had an inability to distinguish, you know, what was coming to me extrasensorily and what was being communicated to me literally. That's mm-hmm. how profound it was. And so it caused a lot of problems. So when I was really set out to find answers to my paranormal questions, I wouldn't accept paranormal answers. And that's why I wrote The Rational Psychic, was because when I was looking for answers, when I was, when I was coming up in this field, all that was out there, that I, as far as I could see, were, were just old wives' tales and mythology, by and large. And I wanted to offer people a real, grounded explanation for how this stuff works, where the information comes from, and why it's real. Well, it's an excellent book. I mean, I definitely recommend it. Um, it really explained a lot to me and brought up lots of questions and things I want to know more about. So I think you need to write a write a second book. So hopefully <laughs> there will be there will be hopefully great. You'll get started on that. And we have several questions for you on chat. Local hero wants to know: Do you believe in past lives, and can they affect you in this life? Oh, that's a really wonderful question. Well. There's a lot of interesting evidence out there that suggests that past, past lives are indeed real. But here's the thing, is that in what past life experts don't always talk about is that time doesn't exist. Mm. Time doesn't exist. When you access extrasensory information, you're accessing a part of consciousness that is independent of time, is independent of location, you know, and is independent of of uh, individuality. So, you know, anyone who can do a quick you know a quick search on Google or, or YouTube or something, you can find lots of interesting articles and videos by scientists who talk about multiverse theory or or you know multiple dimensions and things like that. And it's been mathematically proven that this is real. Uh, and so, all right, you know, we know that every physical object, and human beings are physical objects, have counterparts in other dimensions. So uh, l- let's just say that, that um, you know, past lives, the idea that you've lived another time, you know, is, is a real phenomenon. Well, the reality is, is that some aspect of you isn't, didn't live before now, and didn't live after now, some aspect of consciousness is you right now, you see. Uh, and this, and so, you know, it makes, it, it begs you to wonder, well, how, how and why? How is this real? How is it, the, the, the universe is far more complex than just a simple before, now, and after. It's, it's far more complex than that. 
And what I talk about in The Rational Psychic is that we live in a field of information, uh, what scientists call a holographic reality, most likely. And what it is, the holographic reality is, is and I'll try to make this as simple as possible. If you take a photograph and you tear it in half, what you have are 50% of the information on one sheet of, paper, of the pho photographic paper and the other 50% in the second half that you tore, tore it from. But however, if, if you could take a hologram, which is, which is an image of light, and it, you could tear that in half, you would have two complete holes. And it wouldn't matter if you tore it twice or four times, eight times, 16, 32, uh, 64, or you know, 128, or a billion times. You would have a complete replica of the original whole because all the information of the first is in the last and everyone in between. And so if consciousness, if the if we call it consciousness, or we can call it God, or we can call it, you know, intelligence, or whatever it is, is the energy that creates the universe, the energy that creates worlds, as it were. We are not separate from that. And so each time consciousness divides itself, there's an aspect of the original whole that exists in the replication of it, you see. And so taking into consideration the idea of, of reincarnation or past lives or what have you, we can see that if there is no time and the universe is just expanding and experience is expanding exponentially, at the deepest core of who we are, there is aspects of information and the experiences of every other living being, every other living thing deep within the center of our being. It's part of quantum entanglement. And so what, it, what is uniquely ours becomes, becomes a question. What is uniquely ours? It's that which we hold on to. It's that which is where our awareness is focused. And so can these past lives or these other things affect us? You know, conceivably, conceivably. But what's most important is that you are the master of your awareness. You are the captain of your ship. And you have the power to, to own and control all of that which you are. And we do that by taking a, an inventory of ourselves and processing and dealing with what's there. And that's the most important part of this work. Excellent point, Jack. I feel really strongly about that. One of the reasons I do the show, I move to have people live their best lives possible and know that they have everything within, and it's just finding the tools that work for them. But we've got some more questions here I want to get to. David would like to know, are you medium? Do you talk to dead people? Mm. Well, that's, a, that's another interesting question, David. And I like, I like to say this, is that what we can prove and what we can experience are sometimes two very different things. In my work, there are times where information presents itself that, and it presents itself as an image of a loved one, um, as, um, you know, a family member who's passed on, that sort of thing. And so that is mediumistic, okay? And how, how that information is com communicated and, and processed and, and used within the reading can be highly, highly, highly therapeutic. And when I'm working with clients, I don't think about it this intellectually, but to answer your question, yes, yes, I, I do work on a mediumistic level. Um, but there are times where information is received and it just it, it is, is consistent with, you know, loved ones and old memories and things like this, and it seems more static, more dormant, where you're literally just viewing scenes from an, uh, from another time, or you're or just or revisiting a memory that's being impressed, or you see it kind of as a factual. This is that. Remember when? And so you know, it really comes down to um, you know the experience of the psychic as being able to 
understand and interpret the difference sometimes between what 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 perceives what is perceptually presents itself as say as the spirit of someone and and something that else that kind of is just information that's out there but at the end of the day everything that we perceive is just information it's information stored out there and um it's it's just I don't know, this is a very complex question, and so I can say, for me, yes, I do work on a mediumistic level at times, um, but I also uh, work a lot just as a psychic. Uh, and the way the information is used uh, is unique with each client. Fantastic. Now, Mirror Image wants to know, does the military-type remote viewing work? Is that really real? Uh, you're, it's uh, referred to as CRV, Controlled Remote Viewing, it actually, it is actually very real, uh, and you'll you'll find this. There's some really interesting data out there um, that was declassified. And here's here's something interesting that a lot of people don't know. There's a professor by the name of Jessica Utz, and she worked at UC Davis, and she was a statistician, statistician, and she did some other work. A brilliant, brilliant woman. She was hired by the CIA, I believe, in 1994 or 1995, to review all the research data collected by SRI, the, the Stanford Research Institute, um, and collected during, their, during the time that they ran the Psychic Spy program. And, and Professor Utz came to this conclusion, and this was in her report to the CIA. Statistically, the reality of psychic phenomena is greater the, the, based on the data, it is more statistically significant that psychic perception is real than the FDA's data that aspirin is good for your heart. Wow. <laughs> and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm like, that's a quote. You can quote mm -hmm. me on that. That's like 94%, 95% correct. I maybe got some of the words wrong. But that's, that's a fact. And this is, this is not some, like, woo-woo PhD that got her, you know, her doctorate off the back of a, a match a matchbook or something. This is a this is an educated, real academician who was hired by the CIA. The data out there is actually really, really significant if people would really do their homework. And what's the problem is is that, you know, it's it's you know, psychics are judged more often than not by the least <laughs> by the least of us, mm -hmm, you know, or the yeah. people that are out there sort of banging the drum saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, you know, and, and, you know, I feel like sometimes, you know, it's the personalities that turn people off to the phenomena versus, you know, the phenomena itself, because, you know, behind closed doors, like, you know, if I'm traveling or on an airplane or something and someone's, oh, you know, you're making polite conversation, what do you do? And, oh, you know, this is what I do. Inevitably, I will, for the next four hours on the plane, I'm listening to stories about this guy, oh, you know, when I was a kid, or my wife had this, or my, my mother-in-law, you know, everyone has some experience, and the truth of the matter is that there, there really is something to this. The, the remote viewing program was real. A lot of their data is still classified because of the stuff that they did was pretty amazing. Um, I have a colleague who, who, who worked... In, in some of the early um, development of these protocols, and you know, he's still under a national security agreement almost 40 years later. Wow. Carol would like to know, can you tell us ways to help develop psychic abilities? I, I, I certainly can, and obviously this is, first off, it's important to understand that development is a lifelong exercise. Mm -hmm. It's not a year, it's not two years, it's not six months you are developing for the rest of your life. So that's, that's important to, to understand right off the bat because, number one, it takes the pressure off you, um, and number two, is it, it just puts you in a state of like, okay, let's get real. You know? um, so re really simply, there's two, two things that I talked about at the top of this interview that are essential. One is you have to learn how to recognize psychic information and the two, the second thing is you have to be willing to 
take the risks that are necessary to have your information be objectively verified. You know, and that means we're going to make mistakes. We're going to be wrong sometimes. And, you know, that's okay. You know, and you have to give yourself permission to be wrong. You know, but as you get more and more comfortable with the way that you perceive information, you know, you can begin to identify, oh, I, I know how this feels, or I remember what this means, or, and, and, and as you continue to push and move forward, you know, you become more familiar with your body, with your mind, the sensations that occur during, during you know, perception, and, and you become better. Um, there's something else that just kind of jumped into my head. And this is, oh, this is something that's really, really important to understand as well. You need to, you need to remember that psychic perception is a passive process. It's not something that you do. It's something that you witness. Okay? And so all you're learning to do is put yourself in this relaxed state of receptivity, stilling, quieting everything down, and then observing what comes up. Now, later on, when you become more accustomed to, to maintaining this level of attunement to your subjective self, you can ask questions. You can interact. You can engage with your mind. And, that's, and that is really uh, probably all there is to being a, an advanced psychic, is being able to, in, in CRV and controlled remote viewing, they operate in pairs. You, know, you have the viewer, and then you have the control. And the control helps guide the awareness of the viewer by asking non-leading questions, by pointing the viewer toward the information without, without front-loading them with information, by you know, giving, saying suggestible things such as, uh, tell me what color the car is. Well, now the person's thinking about the car. Instead, they might say something as, um, you know, move to the front of the house. What do you see? I see a red car. See what I'm saying? That's how they guide the viewer, not make the viewer say something by putting the information in there. So in the beginning, you have to, you just have to be the viewer. You have to just take, give yourself permission to let go and see what's there, feel what's there. And then later on, you can begin to direct your awareness more clearly by maybe by creating that subject object experience, say with a guide or something and saying, show me what's this, show me what's that, bring me here. You know, like with remote viewing, they, they'll say something, they'll, they'll give longitude and latitude, and they say, you know, we're, we're now at, boom, 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 you get the longitude and latitude, tell me X, Y, and Z. You know, later on, as you become more adept, you can do that for yourself. But in the beginning, it is just essential that you first make sure that your your motivation is correct, you know, and that the second thing is just be passive, you know, and the third thing is, you know, let yourself make mistakes. The fourth thing, require that your information be verifiable because that will train you to 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 reach a higher standard. I mean, this is something that this is this this is a book. This is you know this is a mm-hmm. whole course. But these are you know some very very basic things to look for and to try for. I don't know if that helps, but uh, we could do a whole other show on that. I'm sure. So, Jack, Absolutely. there are a few questions that I like to ask each guest. The first one, I'm sure, especially in your line of work, mm-hmm. someone's struggling out there. We just had Hurricane Sandy. Someone might be going through a divorce, lost a job. What advice would you have to someone that's struggling right now? Mm. You know, I always like to remind people that when you're struggling, we feel like we've cornered the market on suffering, that we're all alone. And the quickest way out of suffering is to take our attention off ourselves. You know, when you're struggling, you know, it can seem counterintuitive to look for ways to help other people, but our suffering is actually a resistance to our circumstances. It's not our circumstances. And that's a, that's a really, really hard thing to swallow sometimes. But it's true. You know, I, I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to be homeless. 
I know what it's like to hurt. I know what it's like to be alone. I know what it's like to be afraid. But I've also learned over the years what it's like to, to be in the circumstances of suffering and feel okay. You know, it really is our aversion to feeling who and what we are, independent of our circumstances, that creates our suffering. And what I mean by that is that deep within you is a well of goodness. We're not defined by our circumstances. You exist separate from them. Our circumstances, regardless of them, are, are illusory. And so by reconnecting with our power, to reconnect with our power, what we can do is look for ways to reach out to others, to benefit them, when our attention is focused on our own suffering. And what happens is when you turn the attention away from yourself, you reconnect with wholeness because now you're putting yourself in a place of being empowered and you experience that power, you experience that wholeness in your giving to other people. And then what happens is, it's amazing, is that other folks will then say to you, God, you're so calm. God, you always know what to say. You're so amazing. And inside you may be thinking, God, I'm crying or I'm hurting or I'm this or that. But yet the world starts mirroring back to you that you're that you're you're a gift. And I, it's because we go ahead. No, I say I love that. I think that that's yeah, just wonderful. Yeah. We control our experience is, is what I'm trying to say, and uh, you know we don't have to suffer if we can if we can turn our attention to others and and look for ways that we can love, and then the love we experience that love come up from within us. I, I just love that. Now, my final question for you is, because I'm all about action, too, and getting off the couch. So what one thing can people do after the show, tonight, tomorrow morning, to reawaken their brilliance? Oh, my goodness. You know, every morning before I step on the floor, I open my eyes and I, and I say, I am happy, I am whole, I am healthy. And that really right away puts me aligned with my core self, my authentic expression of who I am. And from that moment forward, when I step on the floor, like sometimes I know you're probably the same way. We have a hundred emails waiting for us, or we have kids, or we have responsibilities. And if you don't take those three seconds to align yourself before you get out of bed, you get sucked into the drama of the day, and it feels like you're caught in a whirlwind. So it's important is just those three simple things that align you and reconnect you and make you feel good about who and what you are. And then from that centered place, everything else just slides off you. You just, you see it coming and you step aside. You have to step into your, 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 your own power and connect with who you are. You know, that's, that's my, my two second answer to that question. I know. I love that. Now, Jack, tell us if people want to buy the book, and about your website if they're interested in reading. And I also know we have viewers in Los Angeles, and I believe you have a meetup group. So if you could tell us about that, we'd appreciate it. Well, the meetup group isn't, it, well, it's not active right now because okay. of the publicity for the book. But what I, what I do is I do some, we do some exercises and, and we do training, and it's a very, very kind of in depth kind of look at what this stuff, stuff is, psychic stuff is, and how it works and why. Um, my book is The Rational Psychic, A Skeptic's Guide to Extraordinary Perception. It is uh, the number one ESP book on Amazon right now. It debuted at number one on October 1st. It was number one in parapsychology. It sold out in the United States on, in Amazon two weeks before publication. It sold out in Canada. Uh, it's on the bestseller list. I'm getting emails from all over the world, from Australia, Pakistan, India, Bahrain, France, England, you know, you name it. Canada, people are really, really responding to this book because it comes from a place of truth. Um, and it will give you the nuts and bolts, how to identify the psychic signal in your brain, why this stuff is real, what psychic information looks like, feels like, how to experience it, and we'll even tell you exactly how it is that sometimes psychics see things outside of themselves as if they're in the environment. There's everything you want to know is here. So I just really encourage, if you're a psychic, it's a must read. If you're a paranormal investigator, it will make you a better investigator. If you're curious, if you, want to, you just want to know more, 
This is a fun book. It's full of stories that kind of illustrate everything that I'm saying, and it just it'll just pull you in from page one. It, it, it's it's I have to tell you, it's a great read, and I'm really proud to offer it to everyone. And Amazon, it's, Barnes and Nobles, it's all there. And JackRourke.net is your website, correct? That's correct. Okay, so if anyone wants to find out more information about Jack, and I'm pretty sure, don't you have a link to buy the book on your site as well, too? Oh, yeah, all the links all the links are there. All the links are there. And you can read all the endorsements on Amazon. People like John Holland, uh, John Oliver, um, you know, the American Parapsychology Association have endorsed it. It's, it's, this book is, is very well-researched, and it's a lot of fun. Well, I would, would encourage you all to check it out. I had uh, the joy of reading it and learned a lot and brought up a lot more questions. So I look forward to your second book, Jack, and we'll definitely have you back for that. And I appreciate your time, especially on Halloween. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, everyone. Thank you, Jack, and thanks, everyone, for watching us. We will see you here next week and check out our next show here on Nissan Communications Network. The computer is 2K now, Sundays 9 to 12. I am not your girl for that. If you have any computers questions, the guys will be able to answer it. All right, everyone. Happy Halloween. Bye now. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Sundays, 9 a.m. to noon. Health In with Debbie Brooke, Mondays, 11 a.m. to noon. The Scope of Things with Marilyn Shannon, Mondays, 7 to 8 p.m. Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Mondays, 8 to 9 p.m. Body Talk with Cindy Prince, first Tuesdays, 8 to 9 p.m. Reawaken Your Brilliance with Julie Seibert, Wednesdays, 8 to 9 p.m. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by thatvidblasterguy.com, carolinaapparel.com, and deltaforce.net.